Face tracking autofocus is so important because I don't really want to be keeping changing my zoom points, my focus points every time I move in and out, forward and back of a frame. I can come out the frame, I can come back in the frame and reliably know that within a few seconds that the lens and the camera has the ability to grab focus on my face. This hasn't been something possible for the last 40 videos or so or almost 50 that I've made on YouTube. You see, as much as I've been relying on this lens, the Sigma 18-35 to for this long, for this far, for this many videos, it has been awesome. If you set the focus points, if you turn off the continuous autofocus, and if you're just happy to live without knowing that you'll have to do everything yourself. You'll have to adjust the focus points each time yourself. You'll have to make sure you're in focus yourself. You'll have to get your smartphone from your pocket, even though you've got your script on it, and hook up the app and check your focus constantly each time. It's been quite an annoying struggle. But as you can see from this video, it's all about the Panasonic 10 to 25. And with this lens, I'm finally able to give up on using this and give up on manually tracking focus, manually making sure each time I'm in focus, having to link up the app, and I really think it's time to say goodbye to this. Now the Sigma 18-35 is still a bloody awesome lens. It might be going away for me, I might be retiring it, I might be selling it, I'm not quite sure yet, but I'm definitely not going to be using it as my primary lens anymore. Regardless of this, it's still a great lens if you're starting out in videography. I've been on YouTube for about a year now and it's about time I probably invest because I am really enjoying all of this. Not that you can't probably go on for years more on something like this. I just don't like the non-native interface. If my wife borrows the camera or somebody else borrows the camera, they have to be able to understand how manual focus works. And that's just something that gets really annoying. I have to take it off for them. Whereas if I've got this new 10 to 25, I don't really have to worry about these things. Now here's a little bit of a size comparison between both of them. You can see the Sigma stands about a centimeter taller. The Panasonic, um, it's a bit shorter, but it's a lot fatter with a 77 mil filter thread. Just had to dust off them little particles for this little video because everything is so tack sharp. Now I'm gonna show you this lens hood. You see, it's two pieces. It screws in together. You could probably separate it. And this, I think, was really cheeky, especially when I compare it to something like this Noctichron lens hood, which was made out of metal, aluminium, velvet lined. This lens cap isn't great either. We'll come back to that. But here you can see them against each other. The Sigma was taller and slender and thinner, but the Panasonic being stubbier and fatter. That is probably how she likes it anyways. Now we look at the zoom ring, all smooth and the dampening is great. A bit less than the Sigma, but the Sigma was probably a bit excessive. Bit of a size comparison to this behemoth. It's basically a lot bigger than your average mouse. Now we're gonna look over each of the dials. The aperture A mode here on the aperture dial is basically locks in kind of semi lock with a bit of a notch, it's not going anywhere. As soon as you get past this notch, you can move into smoothly changing the iris, the aperture, whatever you wanna call it. Now I'm gonna go quiet, listen to this. Dang. This is definitely a very satisfying mechanism to come in and out of the focus clutch up and down. Now, when you have it up and you switch to manual mode in the camera, you're basically gonna be doing the electronic fly-by-wire. If you push this focus mechanism down, it's basically like a clutch and you have direct control over the focus blades within the lens. This gives you greater control. It does have semi-hard stops at either end, but continues to spin forever, just like the Sigma does. Now, this lens at 10 millimeters, like many other Panasonic lens, at its widest, it's not the most flattest you have to go to about 12 and a half or rather 13 millimeters to have it at its flattest. 
So basically it pops up a little bit at the widest, near the middle it's at its flattest and towards the end obviously it has its biggest protrusion, extrusion, extrusion? Biggest extension at 25mm, equivalent of 50mm. But nevertheless the zoom ring, the focus mechanism, the iris, they all feel perfectly balanced, perfectly dampened. There's no other controls or buttons to you know, mess with you or confuse you through the rest of the body of this lens. The mount interface is stainless steel, metal, and you have the camera interface contact pins, and the mount is solid, the mount is great, there's no wiggling, wobbling, it's absolutely awesome. Now, why I'm gonna say goodbye to this 18 to 35, is it worth the decision? Is it worth you doing the same? And should you do it? These are all these kind of things that we're gonna go over in this video. Now at this point, I want to show you what used to be regarded as a big lens. This is the damn Nopticron. People thought this thing was huge, but moving on, take this off, get the new bad boy. The Sigma was big, but man, this is just as big without the damn speed booster. And if you don't have a plate or a spacer at the bottom, you're going to hit the bottom of your table surface or your tripod plate. It's a damn big boy. And here we are at its widest. Now with this, I can get really close to the frame. And what does that really mean? I might not get the craziest bokeh, but it means I'm really close to the mic. Cause if you just see here, the mic is just literally out of the frame. Now, I don't really like this close, but say I'm about here and I'm about here. This is what really works for me on these sort of YouTube talking headshots. It means that I'm reliably close to the microphone to give you really punchy audio quality and I get a decent bit of bokeh in the background although the full frame although the full frame although the full frame equivalents might be 3.4 but I'm not really caring about that sort of stuff because I'm a Micro Four Thirds GH5 user. Now at this point I want to show you the difference in photo quality. Photo! This is the 42.5 at f1.2 followed by the Sigma 18 to 35 at f1.2 then a bit of a color shift for some reason but this is the 10 to 25 at f1.7. Let's move on to some autofocus test. Here's the Sigma in 225 autofocus mode and you can see it's just struggling. It can't even get a proper focus lock on this damn subject. It's bloody annoying, you can't rely on it and it's absolutely useless. And at times when you want to think that you can just switch the subject and it might work, it will give you this sort of tank slapping effect. Back to front, back to front, tank slap. autofocus is so horrible that you might as well never use it and most of the people that use the Sigma 18 to 35 for video never ever ever use the autofocus even by accident because it's just horrendous. This tank slapping effect just ruins your shots, it's really jarring, the viewers, the audience will just hate you for it. No matter what you try to start with focus on, this is in single point autofocus mode. Although it's a bit quicker, it's still got that sort of tank slapping nonsense. It does grab focus quicker, it's a bit more reliable, but the focus transition is so rubbish that you just, again, just shouldn't use it. Stick to using the damn focus ring. And again, and again, and again, it's just tank slaps forever. I just don't get it why it loves throwing the glass back to front, like whoever thought that would be great. Now, this is a bit of a confusing thing. Here, I've got the Sigma in complete manual focus mode. And as you can see, the transitions and everything that you can see from little subject to subject, the focus is absolutely creamy. It's as if it's using dual pixel autofocus or Sony's phase detect autofocus systems. But it's not, it's just manually done. And if you're behind the camera, this is not an issue. But the problem is when you're shooting yourself, like me, a YouTuber person, you know, you, you want the focus to be done for you. You're not always gonna be behind the camera. And if you are behind the camera, that's absolutely fine. Now, this is a bit of a generational update. This is the 45 millimeter Noctichron, which came out in around 2014. Now, the whole point of this lens being shown here is to show you how much improvement has been made. Now, you can see it still struggles. It's not always perfect. But for the few frames before this, it did manage to grab focus on the relevant items. Moving on to the 10 to 25. Now, this is on center point autofocus and it grabs focus and the transitions are buttery smooth. 
each and every single time. This is a bit of a long winded video, but it's here to help you make your buying decision. This is not in manual mode. And I promise you one, one spot autofocus mode, it's going from subject to subject. The focus is happening automatically. It's quite quick. All custom settings are off and it's just bloody buttery. Even my hand in the frame out of nowhere, going back to these toys on the display shelf, it manages to grab focus. And you know what? It might take a second sometimes, not always. It might take a second sometimes, but you know it's going to focus on the subject that it's meant to. It's much more reliable and tracking on the Sigma. It's always been horrible. It's just pointless. This is the whole idea of showing you this little clip, but you know, you just might as well forget about it. Now we're going to move on to face shots. This is the Sigma. What is the point of tank slapping someone's face constantly? The moment somebody sees this, they're going to think you're an absolute noob, absolute idiot, and they're probably going to switch away from the video. This is with face tracking autofocus on. It does work at some times and you know, it still can't get rid of this nonsense tank slapping shenanigans. We're going to move on to the 45 mil and you're going to see it is a bit slower, but there's no tank slapping. There's no back focus issues as much as there is with the Sigma and it does keep you in focus. It does track you. The continuous AF is on for these face shots and all on for these previous shots that are done off the different subjects on the table, the props. But you can see it still pretty much works. Whether I go out of the frame, come back, it's able to figure out your face, able to get focus. And this is with native glass. Now this really makes me wonder why we've been using the Sigma at all, all this damn time. Now this is the Panasonic 10 to 25 F 1.7. Focus transitions a lot smoother, a lot quicker. You can actually rely on face tracking autofocus with Panasonic cameras with their bad reputation for autofocus. But as long as face tracking's on and it's a talking headshot and it's one face, I'm sure you'll do just fine. Even two faces, if they're close to each other in depth, it will do fine but in different depths, it will probably struggle. So I'm pretty close to the camera now, only about 30 centimeters away, and it still managed to track. No tank slapping glass nonsense that the Sigma does. And we're only giving up from F 1.2 to F 1.7, not even a full stop of light. So anyways, I am saying goodbye to this lens and I have been using the Noctichron a lot more than I used to. This isn't a review about the Noctichron, clearly, but if you want to see a review about this bad boy, which I find the absolutely most awesome B-roll portrait micro four thirds lens, then hit me up in the comments below and I might consider doing a video just about this alone. So all in all guys, I've got to say this 10 to 25 is damn worth it, especially if you get it at the kind of price that I bought it for, 1200 pounds. You can't really go wrong whatsoever at that sort of price point. You know, like there are, it is amazing glass at the end of the day, 10 to 25 at a constant F 1.7 aperture, D-clicked aperture rings, D-clicked focus rings to get you full manual control without focus by wire, zoom range, everything's dampened nicely, weather sealed, it is a bit big, it is a bit girthy, but she likes it like that anyways. Now I'm gonna have a new rig update video. I'm gonna have a Razer 15 inch blade base for a thousand pound. I don't know how I managed to get it for that price, but you know what? The performance is damn awesome. That review coming up, I have an iPad Pro review coming up. I have quite a few videos coming up in the near future. So subscribe if you wanna see all the good stuff. And in regards to this, give me a thumbs up if you liked it and give me a sub if you really enjoyed it. And I'll catch you guys in the next video.